Hello, I'm Nathan Carlin, Director of the McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics at UT Health Houston. I'd like to welcome you to the first event in this new speaker series organized by the National Collaborative on Humanities and Ethics and Dentistry. Before I introduce your moderator, I'd like to give you a little background on this new series and go over a few housekeeping items. The National Collaborative on Humanities and Ethics and Dentistry is a partnership among three universities the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, the McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics at McGovern Medical School, and the Department of Health, Humanities, and Bioethics at the University of Rochester Medical Center and the Eastman Institute for Oral Health, both at the University of Rochester School of Den Medicine and Dentistry. This new series aims to create unique and valuable opportunities for reflection, learning, and teaching on humanities and ethics issues in dentistry, and to stimulate progress nationwide in using arts and humanities to improve dental practice, research, policy, and education. Some of our primary goals are noted in the chat. We plan to host several events each semester and I welcome each of you to share your ideas for future topics in the post-event survey. Our next event will be a Zoom discussion on dentists and film on April 29th with the film critic and author, Howie Moshevitz. This program is being recorded and will be sent to the RSVPs as well as posted on the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities website in the chat within five business days. If you have questions for the panelists at any time, feel free to use the chat as we will open to the audience later for discussion. I'd like to thank all of you for coming today and the planning committee. The acknowledgements also are in the chat. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Joelle Robinson Pridler, Assistant Professor in the McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlin. I'm really honored to serve as the moderator for our first session of our Dental Humanities and Ethics Speaker Series. And I am speaking to you from Houston, Texas, where it is a beautiful day, chilly for us, about 50 degrees. And I want to wish everyone who celebrates today a happy Mardi Gras. And mostly I'm really excited to introduce our amazing speaker today, Dr. Marsha Brennan, who has such a rich, uh, expertise and experience in both humanities and arts. And I'm so excited to uh, hear about her insight into these oral issues at the end of life. Dr. Marsha Brennan is the Carolyn and Fred McManus Professor of Humanities and Professor of Religion and Art History at Rice University here in Houston, Texas. She is the winner of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum Research Center Book Prize and has served as a fellow at Rice's Center for Teaching Excellence. Her research engages clinical aesthetics in the medical humanities, spirituality and comparative mysticism, and modern art and museum studies. And since 2009, she has also served as artist in residence in the Department of Palliative Medicine at the MD Anderson Cancer, Cancer Center here in Houston, Texas. Um, for her uh, full bio and uh, information about her um, book titles and awards, um, we'd like to drop in the chat um, a link to, to a website if you're interested. Um, and without further ado, I will give you Dr. Marsha Brennan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. That's so lovely. Um, I just want to begin by thanking everyone who's organized this, everyone who's on the call. I am so honored to be here. Um, a little bit more specifically, I'd like to thank Dr. Nathan Carlin for this lovely, lovely invitation to come speak with you. And of course, to Dr. Joelle Robertson Pridler for coordinating so many details and elements of the talk. 
um, this idea for a dental humanities and ethics consortium is just wonderful. It's just a great idea. I am truly honored to be the first speaker and I just wish your group much success with this venture. Um, so just to say, I see that we have like 108 participants and counting, which is fabulous. Um, there were several questions um, who uh, that came. Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you so much, David. There were several um, questions that came up prior to the talk, um, and so the way that I would like to work this, and that my team, the team has agreed to this, is um, I'm going to give this paper. And then there are very strong, you know, emotional or intellectual or ethical or psychodynamic concerns and issues that could come up based on the paper that none of you have heard me present yet. So what I'm going to do is I want to, and I've purposely left open some space um, for um, discussion and conversation in response to this paper after just to allow some conversation. And so this may run later because I intend to stay on this Zoom and to answer every question that came in. Um, and so for those who have not been able to um, attend live, your questions will be answered on Zoom. So if you have responses to, or questions that come up to what you're hearing, please put them in the chat. Joelle will moderate this, but maybe we can have some conversation before I take the, the questions that came in. Okay. And then my very last thing that I'll say is that I'm going to be talking about a lot of very sensitive material. Some of you may want to get a Kleenex or a tissue in hand just in case. Better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Okay, so with that, thank you for my slides. Um, I'm going to begin today by briefly introducing myself and describing the clinical work that I do. And then, of course, I'm going to take you into the hospital rooms with me, the best part, of course, always, and present the th uh, three clinical case studies, each of which engages important issues relating to the mouth and to related issues of taste, voice, speech, power, and the uniqueness of human identity. At the end, I'll answer any questions that you have. Um, I will stay on longer to answer those that have come in. Um, and I'm hoping that we can have a lively conversation about the themes and issues that the stories raise. Okay, so with that, I'd like the next slide, please. Okay, so let me just provide a little bit of background and context for this work. Who am I and what do I do in just a teeny little bit more depth? By training, I'm a modernist art historian. Okay, so in my day job, yes, I am a professor of the humanities at Rice University, and I do work in the fields of modern and contemporary art history, religious studies, and medical humanities. Since early 2009, I can't believe it's about to be 15 years, it has also been my privilege to serve as a literary artist in residence in the Department of Palliative Care and Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, and so just so you know, and some of you will be familiar, but so my department chairman is Dr. Eduardo Breyera, and it's really um, that particular unit and department, it's really quite storied within palliative medicine. Um, one physician has described it as the Mecca. It's where people go to be certified um, as fellows um, in this area. Okay, so on top of that, since early February of 2021, I've also been doing this work remotely on both the general oncology and the stem cell transplantation units at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and so you can see here some images of the various contexts in which I work. Um, and so of course on top is Rice and then you've got Anderson on the left, you've got Penn on the right. What's interesting about this is that literally, uh, so there's a foot here in palliative, there's a foot here in essentially a very aggressive form of oncology where people are fighting for their lives. They've looked at the end of life and they are undergoing all kinds of aggressive transplantation therapies um, within these oncology um, practices. And then on top, rice as well. And then the idea of how the university as an academic center may triangulate, facilitate, um, you know, and engage such affiliations. Um, just a few more little brief preliminary remarks. What led me to do this work? So I'll just say that as an art historian, I am privileged to see and work honestly with some of the most beautiful things in the world. Literally, I get to work with Rembrandts and Van Goghs, with Monet's and Georgia O'Keeffe's. 
Yet several years ago, I'd reached a point in my life and career where I wanted to see if the skills and the tools of the arts and the humanities could translate into some of the darkest and most difficult areas of modern life, not always just the most beautiful ones. So I am happy to tell you that yes, they can. Um, and you'll see in this talk some of the ways in which those translations um, are possible. Also for background purposes, I'll just say at the outset um, that for the past 15 years, I have literally worked with thousands of people and I have witnessed hundreds of passings. Okay, so there's simply just a base of um, experience in that viewing and in that presence. And so there too, you are welcome to ask me anything um, about this um, in the question and answer period. Okay, next slide, please, David. Thank you. Okay, so what exactly do I do in these rooms? Um, let me tell you what I do not do. I Well, I do wear a regular hospital badge, but I do not wear a white coat. I do not allow anyone to call me Dr. Brennan, and I bring no technology into the room with me whatsoever when I'm bedside at MD Anderson. I realize that this sounds extraordinary, and I'm happy to talk about any of that in Q&A. Um, at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, of course, technology is a necessity, and so I'm brought into patients on an iPad. So when I'm in those rooms, when I visit with patients and their caregivers, we talk together, and I, with my pen and notebook, I record the narratives and images that are meaningful to them. I write in a simple paper journal and I use a 29 cent plastic Bic pen, okay? Or something like this, okay? El Cheapo. All of this is intentional. So, um, and, and you'll hear why, why this approach is the one that I take um, when we get into the rooms in just a second. And so when I'm there and I'm bedside, the first thing I do, of course, is I have to evaluate how strong the person is. Um, I have to evaluate their state of mind and lucidity. Are they oriented times one, two, three, or four? Um, and then um, sometimes there will be technology um, that will be in place. I have to see um, if there's hearing loss or if the person's on high flow oxygen. You never, ever want to make the person strain. And so it's all about essentially being a guest in their home. I will ask them if one side or the other is better for them. And I will uh, introduce myself just by saying, hi, my name is Marcia. I'm an artist in residence here. I come on Fridays and I talk with people and I'm wondering if we can talk for just a few minutes. And then I'm just reading their energy. It's very subtle. Um, and then um, when they say yes, I'll, I'll just ask if one side's better the, uh, than the other, et cetera, so that they're comfortable and so that it restores just some degree of the familiarity of a visit um, and just uh, essentially just some degree of humanity um, into this otherwise highly mediated clinical setting. Okay, so then as we're talking, I'll tell them that when we visit, I typically ask one big question, and that is, if I were to ask you if there's an image in your mind of something special and meaningful for you, and it can be anything in the whole world, but something important for you or close to your heart, what would that be? And then the person will become very quiet. And then they will open their eyes and start to tell me. And as they speak, I just write down their words verbatim. Um, with everything they say. If the narratives that we produce sound like me, they're essentially not good for anything. It's about being able to listen closely and deeply to capture voice. And so much of this work engages that. Mm, that verbatim element is super important. And then while we're visiting, I arrange their words into successive lines that resemble poetry, but it's not rhyming. It just has a regular flow and speech pattern, but it's just line by line. And so then once I know that I have the story, I will read that story back to the person. Um, and I'll say, well, can I tell you the story I heard you tell me? And they'll say yes. And they will often be in tears. They will be so moved by the beauty and profundity of what they have just said. Um, I invite them to make any changes or corrections that they want. And then I hand when at the hospital at Anderson, um, I inscribe the stories into a handmade paper journal. And that's the slide that you're seeing here. I have these specially made up for this work. It's handmade mulberry paper with pressed flowers and leaves and blank cream colored pages. And so in, that are in a heavy cardstock. 
And so it's something that is substantial enough not to feel like, you know, it's so fragile in these fragile circumstances, but it's not so heavy and weighty that it feels like the book of life is running out um, or too heavy to bear um, also in these fragile circumstances. So what this does is it provides a tangible record and something tangible to hold on to at a transitional moment when life itself is slipping away before our eyes. Okay. Um, and then at Penn, when I do the work remotely, I will subsequently email the person their narrative. Okay, so then what it is that you're about to hear now, because I'm about to take you into the rooms, what you hear is that as an artist, I work in the media of language and human consciousness. As dentists, you do this too. You work practically, you work physically, you work sculpturally, but you also work in the media of language and human consciousness. And obviously these are key aspects um, within your the craft of your practice as well. Um, so as you're gonna hear in these stories, issues of voice, identity, appearance, communication, and the ability to speak and express oneself are all integral to this work just as they are absolutely integral to the work that all of you do as well. So again, having at end of life, this becomes particularly sensitive because this has everything to do with how people are seen and heard in life and at the end of life. So within these challenging settings, I found that it's necessary to acknowledge what's there and then to hold space for other visions and possibilities to emerge. Within this practice, the patients and their caregivers provide the content of the stories, while I provide the practical means for the artwork's realization. So much of my work, and really, um, to put a technically to put a fine point on it, it's positioned at the um, intersection of literary aesthetics and psychosocial oncology. I'll repeat that. The work that I do, technically, I would say, is positioned at that intersection of literary aesthetics and psychosocial oncology. Another way of expressing that idea is that I, you know, help to create the conditions for expression and hold space for people so that they can be present to themselves and to others when facing extremely challenging illnesses and life at the end of life. When I ask people about the images that are significant for them, they're able to witness their own beauty and that sense of conscious recognition often serves as a transformational element, which you will now see as I take you into the hospital rooms with me. So with that, that can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, okay. So our first story, yes, this was intentional. Our first story is called Everything Comes Alive with Cherry Pie. So I'll bet you were all wondering about that title. And yes, as dentists, I did want to get your attention and I thought that that might do it. Okay, so this story comes um, from my work at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I will note that that story and the, the third and final story and the accompanying illustrations, including the one that you see here, um, are all part of a book, one of my books um, that'll be published um, forthcoming from Routledge. And it's gonna be called The Colors of Life, Exploring Life Experience Through Emotion and Color. So um, the, sto the story that you're about to hear, our first story is an end of life story. Um, and um, it is, as I said, coming from Penn. Um, and this encounter provides an opportunity to reflect on key issues relating to taste, speech, food, voice, memory, and presence, as well as on matters of the heart and the home. Um, I think it may also provide each of you with a novel perspective on sugar, desserts, and what it can mean to taste the sweetness of life. And that's why I'm choosing to lead with this vivid narrative. Another reason why I'm choosing this narrative is because this story also presents a really unique perspective on the color red, which is also something that you look at all the time. So I'll begin with that theme. As healthcare providers, you see the color red all the time, right? As you engage, routinely with interior regions of the human body. But in nature, we don't often see a lot of red. And perhaps that's why we get so excited when we see a ripe strawberry or a ripe cherry or raspberry or a bright red beet or the vibrant center of a Swiss chard. Red fruits and vegetables are so beautiful 
but in nature, we only see a splash of red here and a splash there, like a cardinal flying through the green. So this narrative unfolds with a splash of red. One day, I met an elderly man who told me a very moving story about why he loved cherry pie so much. As this man said, everything comes alive with cherry pie. And that phrase ended up being the title of his literary artwork. So these are his words verbatim. My image is of a big piece of homemade cherry pie about four inches high and three inches wide with a nice homemade crust on it. The crust is a nice crispy, crystally looking brown because of the baked sugar. My mom was a great cook, and she made some of the best cherry pie that I've ever tasted. Hopefully, no one got to the pie while it was cooling on the windowsill. The pie was filled with bright red cherries that looked delicious. The cherries were sweet and juicy and a little bit tart. When you eat cherry pie, the cherries peak a, a burst of flavor, and then everything comes alive. This brings me wonderful memories of home. The cherry pie is heartwarming, it's satisfying, it's tasteful, and it's all a gift. Okay, so for this man, a whole world of meaning and feeling were contained within that homemade slice of cherry pie. That cherished image grounded the man in sweet, deeply rooted memories of home and family. The pie brought him a heartwarming sense of comfort, and it connected him to a powerful life force that was so strong and vibrant that, in his words, everything came alive when he tasted the pie. The story gives you a sense of the power underpinning such images and how the vital subjects of life and love can be experienced both in memory and through the senses, in this case, through sight, smell, and taste. Now, as dentists, when you see the effects of sugar and the consequences of too many of these desserts, you might have another perspective on what these subjects can mean metaphysically and emotionally to a person within the scope of their life. And once again, that's an end of life story that you just heard. So I just also want you to see that at the end of life, even during that transitional moment, we can still see flashes of creativity and vitality. Red is the color of the vitality of life. Like a baked cherry pie cooling on the windowsill, the color red is often associated with the inside of things rather than with the outside of things. So that story provides a glimpse into the inner world of a man's life and heart and his memories of being deeply loved, all of which came back to him with vivid clarity at the end of his life. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Story number two, very different story. It's called, I am a warrior, red like the heart and autumn gold. <clears throat> and so, yeah, it does also center a bit on the color red. This is a very different story, though, and it engages critical ethical issues, <clears throat> excuse me, concerning agency and power, voice and choice. This story is coming to you from the Acute Intensive Palliative Care Inpatient Unit at MD Anderson, and <clears throat> I'm going to be very precise technically about this case. The patient was a middle-aged man suffering from advanced adenoidic cystic carcinoma of the nasopharynx. He told me um, about this, and the medical team told me about this, and they told me that for many years, this man was a chain smoker and that he also used both chewing tobacco and snuff. On the day that I met him, the entire right side of this man's face and jaw were swollen and disfigured with dark tumors protruding out from underneath the skin. Before I entered the room, the medical team had informed me that there were some strong emotional and communication difficulties associated with this particular individual. And yes, this was indeed the case from a combined physical, emotional, and psychosocial perspective. 
Um, here, I'll just note that every time I enter a patient's room, I remain open to whatever arises. So sometimes that involves listening really closely and acknowledging what is not working well. And sometimes that type of deep listening proves to be extremely powerful. And this was certainly the case on that occasion. Although the man was very weak and drowsy, he was eager to work together to produce an artwork that would make his complex spiritual imagery concrete, both to himself and to those around him. Perhaps most strikingly, despite the extreme pain and disfigurement of his advanced metastatic cancer, this man continued to see and describe himself as a warrior. As he proudly told me, that's my spirit, that's my way. His story is entitled, Red Like the Heart and Autumn Gold. These are his words. I am a warrior, it's in my heart. I'm a big game hunter. I hunt deer in the woods by my home. That's my spirit, that's my way. I also gather food and grow vegetables. There's Thanksgiving and the family table. That's what it's all about. I'm hunting now. I'm with Sitting Bull and the Warriors. I'm also Roman Catholic, and I can put them all together now. They're all connected. Now I see them all as one way of knowing. I'm not afraid of death, and it's upon me. I'm at peace with myself. We all hunt and track together as one. It's in my heart. I am a warrior. So, when I had read those words back aloud to the man after the team had been having so much communication difficulty with him, when he heard his words and I read them back aloud, the man surprised me a little bit because he was frail, but he thumped his chest very hard, like thump, you could hear it. And then he proclaimed that that was what was in his heart. With tears in his eyes, he told me that he wanted the narrative artwork to be featured at his memorial ceremony. Um, so with his permission, I subsequently published um, this story in one of my books on life at the end of life, and I commissioned an accompanying illustration for that from the West Coast visual artist Lynn Smallwood, and that's the image that you see here. So the image reflects the man's story. Um, this is a pencil drawing that connects multiple layers of personal and archetypal imagery to create a scene that is at once vividly concrete and deeply metaphorical and metaphysical. In this illustration, the forest becomes a world of symbols and forms, shadows and reflections. Throughout the surface of the drawing, alternating patterns of darks and lights create a strong sense of design, while contrasting elements provide the primary structuring forms of the composition. Following the interior pathway of the image, the strong vertical lines of the tree trunks cast long diagonal shadows along the forest floor. The tall trees frame the composition while creating a sense of interior depth that extends into the distance and culminates in a clearing that is filled with light. Along this pathway, a few stark tree limbs and stray rays of light connect the two sides of the drawing, just as they crisscross the circular entrance of the aperture. A Native American figure walks along the forest path, while a short distance away, a deer pauses at the opening and turns to face him. Both the hunter and the deer appear to be solid yet etheric as, as they stand poised at the edge of the rising light. That's the visual. Back to the clinic. When expanding on his warrior imagery, this man at the end of his life told me, and again, this is a quote, when warriors hunt, they make their kills quickly. I'm not afraid of death and it's upon me, but I do fear the pain of the illness and the dying process. Okay, so that's all what he said to me. So in this difficult context, Warrior imagery provided the man um, with an archetypal framework to describe who he was, how he lived, and how he wished to die. He was adamant, absolutely adamant, that he did not want to undergo the protracted illness, weakness, and suffering associated with advanced 
metastatic cancer. Instead, he wanted to die quickly and naturally, as much like a warrior as possible. And this is where it gets especially interesting because all of that made him, quote unquote, a particularly difficult patient from the standpoint of clinical medicine. This man had begun, recently begun to receive proton therapy, which was then a new type of radiation therapy that required him to enter into a device where he was physically immobilized for the duration of the procedure. He had already received one such treatment and the experience had generated so much anxiety and distress that the session had to be discontinued. While this new therapy could potentially have extended his life by several months, it would have been necessary for him to undergo several additional rounds of treatment, and he absolutely did not want to do that. Instead, he wanted to die quickly, and he asked the medical team to facilitate his passing. Okay. So that was the situation that I stepped into that day when I came on the unit at Anderson. Um, initially, some of the healthcare providers, after I walked out of the room and had the narrative, some of my colleagues and healthcare providers saw the man's response as his, quote, quote unquote, refusing therapy and wanting to die, end quote. Um, that situation um, created a great deal of distress, both for the team and for the patient and his family. Um, some of whom saw it as a form of prematurely giving up. Even after my visit, some people dismissed the artistic imagery as a type of escapism, and one healthcare provider commented that they found it odd that this man preferred such hunting imagery to the real world. However, that thankfully was not the majority voice on this. Others very quickly recognized that the man was making a larger statement concerning his priorities regarding autonomy and quality of life, and they realized that warrior imagery provided valuable insight into his perspective, as well as a common vocabulary for discussing what was vividly real and important to him. In very practical terms, there was now concrete imagery that opened up a new avenue of communication regarding quality of life issues and the options that were available to this man and his family. Ultimately, the entire team played an important role in this man's care, and he was able to return home and spend the last month of his life in his house by the woods. Shortly after leaving the hospital, the family sent a photo of the man sitting in his beloved garden, admiring his plants and smiling. So in such extremely challenging circumstances, preserving the integrity of personal identity amidst the fragmentation and disfiguration of terminal illness itself can be seen as a kind of heroism. The warrior imagery provided this man with a powerful model of fighting for his right to live and die with some degree of autonomy and thus with dignity, just as it united his image of himself with that of divine presence. The story brought the man back to himself and created a template for his being in a state of integrity at the end of his life as the courage of the heart became vividly expressed in shades of red and autumn gold. Okay, so I want you to know, I realize that this is a lot to take in and it's a lot to hear and process intellectually, emotionally, um, conceptually, philosophically, etc. So I have one more clinical story that I'm going to take you into. And then I have some remarks um, kind of to conclude. And then I'm really hoping that we can have conversation around your thoughts about what you're hearing. Okay, so with that, um, the next slide, please. So I'm gonna transition once again and now share a final story um, that features another kind of landscape epiphany and which again emphasizes themes of freedom and oneness. Um, this detail is important. This story comes to us from the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so Penn is really interesting because it um, is actually a center of excellence um, and, it, and it has been because it was uh, it had a role in pioneering novel therapies for transplantation technologies. 
um, for stem cell transplantations. Um, and so as a result of that, a lot of people will come to, to Perlman and to Penn um, specifically to receive stem cell transplantation and bone marrow transplantation for really, really aggressive leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myelomas, right? This is, I see a lot of those kinds of transplantation procedures at Penn. And so this story um, is coming very much from that venue. Um, so it's not palliative, it's transplantation. And that's really important, that detail, because um, the older woman I was visiting with that day had just received her cells. She just got her stem cell transplantation the day before to help combat the extremely aggressive lymphoma that she was actively fighting. I, I'm emphasizing that detail for a reason, because advanced cancer patients, and particularly those undergoing or who have undergone multiple rounds of aggressive therapies, such as chemotherapy, often have extensive complex dental issues. Um, these challenges can relate both to the disease itself, to the cancer, and to the very harsh treatments that individuals sometimes receive for their condition. So when they're undergoing these types of aggressive treatments, there are always, almost always accompanying issues of nausea, vomiting, and altered sense of taste, overall weakness and frailty, and a compromised immune system, among other potential complications. So these patients, can pose very special needs and challenges as they're presenting to you, to all of you, with these complex oral conditions. The reason why I chose this story is because it's so important to keep in mind, as I'm sure you all do, but just to be able to hear it and see it from another perspective, that these individuals are actively fighting for their lives. They're doing just what they have to do, and that these are real people behind the often very, very difficult and co complex medical conditions that you confront professionally. So in the case of stem cell transplantations in particular, I, talking to them, I see that each one is undergoing a fight for their life and then a kind of rebirth as they are hoping to begin the next phase of their life. So with these themes in mind, I'll say that that was absolutely the case that day with the visit um, that I'm describing here and that these themes resonate throughout the story. So this woman was also brought to tears as she heard the beauty of her own narrative at this incredibly, incredibly complex and charged transitional moment in her own life. Um, she also told me that her image of a lack of fear gave her a sense of freedom and power as she began um, her new life after transplant. These are all her words now. The title of her story is called, It Just Went Far and Forever. And so these are her words when I asked her about her images. This is what she told me. She said, I would like to have an artist's degree. I always felt like I was an artist. My image is of being on a white horse as a very little girl and going across an open field with my cousin. I was bareback. I was pretty small. I can still see the little cotton dress I was wearing with the little lavender flowers. I grew up in the country. My, my stepfather's family is Native American and he raised me since I was small. It was just the freedom and the suddenness of my cousin putting me on the horse. It was the lack of fear and the freedom. Not everybody has this but I felt I was absolutely gifted not to have fear. People could look into my eyes and see things and feel things. The land was ours, and I didn't know boundaries. It just went far and forever. It was a wide-eyed moment. My cousin put me on that horse at full gallop, and I felt comfortable with it. I was about two years old. The earth was the connection. I could see the blue and the white of the sky, and the sky and the land merged together. There were no fences and no boundaries. It was just straight up energy. There was absolutely nothing in front of me but the grass and the world and God. It just went far and forever. 
Okay, next slide, please. Thank you all for hearing all of that. So all of the stories that I've shared with you today share, shed important light on issues relating to the mouth, to voice, to taste, to appearance and identity, to the ability to express oneself and be heard, and ultimately to the humanity of the patients themselves. The first story engages images of food consumed both for nourishment and for pleasure. In an end-of-life context, the image of a gigantic slice of cherry pie provided an elderly man with a vivid way to remember cherished themes of home and family, childhood, nurture, and care, and ultimately of being loved as he tasted a sweetness that he remembered for the rest of his life. The second story engages critical issues concerning disfiguration and physical appearance, identity and will, and related themes of dignity, choice, and agency. Of course, all the ethical issues associated with having one's voice heard and one's wishes respected. And then the third story centers on related issues of freedom, courage, and spirituality while looking squarely at death and anticipating ongoing life. Hearing such stories can help you as healthcare providers to keep in mind the humanity of the people whom you're treating and the larger life contexts in which narratives um, are situated. Such stories can provide valuable insight into why you're doing this important work, why it all matters. In so doing, you are also attending to the humanity of your patients as individuals, and you're attending even in a way to your own humanity as individuals and as caregivers. This is all part of the gift that comes from listening closely and maintaining this heightened sense of presence. Such interactions can generate a very special dynamics of care between you and your patients, and truly, that is a gift for everyone. Okay, so thank you. I believe that there's one more slide. That would be it. So on the note of that very last slide, um, I am going to stop the stories there, and I hope now that we can have a lively conversation um, and so for those of you who um, were coming in a little bit later, um, I'll just repeat, um, in doing this work for 15 years at Anderson, I've literally worked with thousands of people. I've been present at hundreds of passings. Um, I've just, I've simply just seen a lot. Um, so there are questions that have come in already um, that are prepared. Um, and so, and I do have answers to those, but even some of the things that I've spoken about um, may be different from um, that which people wanted to ask about before they got to hear the talk. So I'd like to take questions in real time from those of you who have just heard the talk, um, and then I'm going to um, stay on the call to answer all of the questions that came in. So on that note, I, I would love to hear whatever might be on your minds. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. That was beautiful talk and beautiful stories that, that you shared with us. Um, and to start this discussion, which I think can be very, very rich, um, I will start with some questions that came in specifically um, about your talk, and then we can maybe broaden it out into other questions people might have previously asked before hearing it. Um, <clears throat> uh, one question in the um, Chad, do you have a perspective on how to approach this with children? Oh, it's so interesting. You know, I wish I did. Um, I will say, and I, I should have said this at the beginning, all of my, I'm, and I'm, I'm sorry, um, all my work has been with adult populations. And so the whole pediatric oncology, peds, it's a whole different animal. Um, it just, it honestly is, it's a different specialty. Um, I have not ever worked professionally with pediatric populations. Um, so to approach end of life, what I will say, 
is that because I am really just blessed, there's no other word for it, to be part of the team uh, at Anderson, um, we have a psychologist on that team. And um, actually, she retired a few years ago. We have a different one now. But um, her name is Martha Ashenbrenner. And Martha is a renowned child life specialist. And so I watched Martha do her work um, with children. Um, so it, I did not ever see her work on the pediatric oncology units. But I saw her um, work with children on uh, the adult uh, uh, the uh, you know palliative care unit when children had to be told that their grandmother would be passing. I did see that. And so the way that it's there is that it, it, I saw it bedside um, with a little boy who was about eight and he was surrounded very lovingly by his mom and his grandma and another aunt. And, you know, Martha led the discussion and she just said, you know, as I think you know, we're getting to a point now where your grandmother's going to have to leave you. And, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't love you and that she, you know, won't ever stop loving you. And he, of course, then cried. And it was a question of his mom and Martha and myself just all being there to hold him while he cried. And then he could then stop crying after a few minutes and look at his grandma and then they could hug and then they could talk more freely with the understanding that this was happening. And so I watched this child in real time go through, go through that trauma, go through that pain. But yet um, then again, no one can cry forever. This went on, you know, for about five, six minutes. And of course it's heartbreaking, but how much more heartbreaking if it hadn't happened or if we hadn't been able to be there for that. And then for his grandmother to say, but I'll, yeah, I'll never stop loving you. And then they could talk and they could talk more freely. And it was really beautiful. And so it's about being honest and staying present. And one of the response on this one um, is that um, it also relates to a question that came up in um, the chat um, that was a, a question we received previously about Alzheimer's patients as well, or patients with dementia and how to approach end of life questions with them. Um, so um, the, the same in a way, in a way, there's something similar in that you can only meet people where they are. That you can only meet people where they are. And so this little boy was robust enough to understand that, you know, his grandmother had to leave, but you can't ever, whether it's an adult patient, whether it's children, what, no matter who is there in the situation, you can't force someone to accept their death or their own death. You, you just, you can't make a tree grow by pulling on its leaves. You have to meet people where they are. And I think that that may be the takeaway on this. You have to meet people where they are. And so, no, while I've not worked with pediatric oncology patients, I have worked with children within these complicated circumstances. And I have had the privilege of being present and meeting people where they are. So I hope that begins. That That's the, the best answer I can give. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. There's two more questions that kind of relate um, yeah. about how you kind of um, start working with people. So how are individuals approached to agree to participate? Um, are people willing to share? And uh, have you ever had the uh, occasion where patients are reluctant to work with you? Great questions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. And so remember at the beginning how I said, and I understand that this sounds and looks eccentric, but I don't let people call me Dr. Brennan. I don't wear the white coat, but I do wear the badge. So it's clearly, you know, that I do have some credentials and like I should be there. But um, I honestly try to do this as gently, you know, um, and as much just like visiting, like like uh, just a nice visit. Um before I go on to the unit, before I go on to the rooms, I always seek out the charge nurse. And I'm always like, because there's only so many people I can see on a particular day since I'm literally going between three institutions, right? And so um, I, it's all about, for me, who's in the most emotional suffering? I have to triage it that way. Not who has the best story, not necessarily who's got the most grandchildren and wants to say something. Although of course I'm interested in hearing that too, but it's really who's in the most pain. Um, and then are they oriented times one, two, three, four? Um, very often I will go in while the person is actively dying and the family is in deep grieving and pain. And so it's really all about um, prioritizing emotional suffering. Um, and then when I go in, um, I'm going in with that knowledge. Um, 
And I, as I just literally just say, I'm Marsha. I'm an artist in residence. I come on Fridays. If it's an end of life situation and the person in the bed is active or on their way to being so, I will just see who is the person sitting closest to the bed or who is the most senior person in the room. And I will go to them first as kind of a way to honor and note their presence. And I'll just say, is that your husband? And then I'll just say, okay, so I've just got one question for you. Can you tell me something wonderful? absolutely wonderful about your husband. And they will almost always say yes. Um, sometimes I've sat in the room even with the body after the person has passed and people are are crying and mourning. Um, I've been there at the moment of, it's so gentle, but it's very rare that people are not able to be there, uh, that are not able to at least have something. And then it's all about reading the energies so gently. You, you know, you never ever want to impose something. You can't and shouldn't, you know, make people do something that they are unwilling or unable to do. So it's about just creating a little bit of breathing space to honor and allow something to come forth. So I do very little setup. If I did this whole asking permission or ahead of time or any of this stuff, people would get so caught up in the protocol and the analytical protocol of it. And they might be intimidated or afraid. I'm not artistic. Oh no, I'm not going to be asking you to draw anything. It has to be within the, the gentleness and spontaneity of the moment. And then once the narrative is in hand, if I want to use it within a situation like you heard today, I will then kind of blow my own cover and I'll say, yeah, so my name is Marsha, but in fact, I am really Dr. Brennan. I'm a professor at Rice. I'll explain. And I'll say that I do speak about this work. I teach classes. I publish. I write. And I'm just wondering if I, if it's all HIPAA protected and all that, may I have permission to share parts of your story? And people there's only once in 15 years when people said no. It's really extraordinary. People love the idea that in some way what they're going through can be of help and service to others and that there's a legacy there um, because they're your teachers. They are your teachers more than I'm your teacher. Um, so that is all kind of on how you do it. You just, you have to assess the situation after just doing it. You all know, you all know. It's all about experience, reading subtle energies, how nervous is the person, um, how, what, you know, how much energy do they have, what state are they in, what might be the best way to approach them. Um, and so it's just, you know, tailoring that to the situation and being present. Um, then as far as people declining, yeah, there are some people who will just say, you know, I'm just not in that place. And it can be because they recognize how powerful this may be and they're not willing to go there. And I'll just say, okay, I'm just so glad I got to meet you and offer you the question, thank you. And then I just leave very delicately. The thing about this, there's no ego in any of this. Whatever comes forth, it can only be perfect. The An opportunity, um, you know, was made to to do this work to, and the, it was offered. The offering was created. So after that, it's not up to me to control that outcome. Come. I'm literally just there as a servant. And so whatever comes forth, it can only be perfect. And so that's the kind of light touch, I think, that that is part of what makes this work. Joelle, did that answer the question? I think so. Yeah, that was that was helpful. Um, is it is this right that it's not really the patients knowing about this and asking for it, but it's really a referral from the nursing staff, the charge nurse who know the patient situation. The nurses are just the best. I realize I'm speaking to a room full of doctors, but I'm sorry, the nurses, they know, I mean, the doctors are amazing too, but the bedside nursing team are the ones who know exactly what's going on. And even between them, they're like, yeah, like she's really suffering, but that guy's even suffering more. And so like, they'll be generous, right? And it is very much a team. And so, yeah, um, occasionally I do get referrals. I get referrals from the attending physician or from the department head, like, oh, we've got a family and 47, boy, could they use you? And so, yeah, of course, I will prioritize those referrals. So I will get them via email before I go on to the unit. Um, and then I'll go there first. Um, but then beyond that, it is a, a, the charge nurse and then the attending bedside nurses. That's how, yeah, that's exactly how it is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think you partially answered this question, um, but Dr. Carlin was asking if you could talk a little bit about the ethics of telling patient stories, um, especially at the end of life, and what is required of us beyond compliance, and maybe further adding, like, how, how can you really honor these, these people and their stories? So, um, I, yeah, I'm happy to answer that. So, again, like, I am very forthcoming 
a lot, most of the stories, right, are very personal. And so they have to do with family. When I ask people about the images that are closest to their heart, you know, half the time, if not more, it'll be, oh, my family. It'll be a portrait of my family altogether. In which case I'll be like, okay, how many people are in your family? And then I'll start typically with the spouse. And then I'll say, I'll ask for each person's name and I'll be like, well, can you tell me something wonderful about that person? So with those stories, they're entirely personal and they um, stay entirely with the family. So whole corpus of stories that are even beyond, even well beyond um, what um, or, or anything that should ever, that will never leave the room. It's really for those families. Um, and but um, for those who um, the stories that I tell, it's because there's a larger generalizable point that lends itself to um, HIPAA compliance. And in those cases, I explain very clearly, you know, who I am. And um, and exactly, you know, it's so interesting. The people in the bed, they they get it immediately like they don't need any advanced instruction as to why healthcare providers need to see patients as human beings, and particularly why cancer patients and people at the end of life should be seen as human beings. Like they're on it, they totally. And so they're like, absolutely go ahead. People are almost always adamant and honored about, you know, here about having the stories shared. And they're just, they're happy to do that. Um, if there were even any kind of like hesitancy, I'd be like, no, no, thank you so much. This should stay with you. So again, it's really about being sensitive to the subtle energy reading it closely um, and just doing what is right. And then the other thing that I'll say um, in response to Nate's point, it's so interesting. There's a palliative medicine physician named Dr. Michael Ashby, A-S-H-B-Y, and he writes about the literature on the end of life. And one of the points that he makes that's so true is that very often it's the patient's voice that's, that's seldom heard or let alone honored. And so like, why do we not have this kind of corpus of end of life stories? There's really not a precedent for this. The closest thing which is really something quite different, is narrative medicine. So Dr. Rita Charon, C-H-A-R-O-N at Columbia Presbyterian and Columbia School of Medicine has pioneered narrative medicine. But that is, quote unquote, honoring the stories of illness. That's the subtitle of her book. And so these are uh, working with patients, encouraging them to be writing about their illnesses and the illness experience. And these stories are called pathographies, right? Literally, the narratives are writings of illness. The stories I've shared with you are not pathographies. These are coming from that context of um, oncology and end of life, but you know, they're not really stories about cancer per se, or that experience. Very rarely do people speak about that. Instead, they're speaking about life and about what's vibrant and meaningful for them. So I think in having these stories heard um, in forums like this and in other educational forums, um, it is part of bringing to light something that is almost still in a lot of ways undiscussable in our culture or that our culture struggles with discussing. Death and dying remain the capital fear of many, if not most people, right? And so to understand that that is a phase of life that can and probably should be integrated within the broader scope of what it means to live and to be alive and that this is one moment within a spectrum and a continuum and that there can be incredible beauty, creativity, life, and humanity up to and including at the end of life. And I, I will argue strongly, Nate, that there is not necessarily a sharp distinction between ethics and aesthetics. And I know you would agree with this. And um, if you want to jump in and speak about that, that would be interesting. But that ethics and aesthetics are indeed coextensive propositions. That would be the line that I would take on that one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here's another interesting question. Um, since this work seems so important and you're talking about the fact that we don't have enough of these stories in the patient's perspective. <clears throat> uh, do you consider your work as a therapeutic intervention that could or has been quantified, uh, for example, in terms of quality of life, end of life choices? Um, and also um, this, the person who asked this question said that, thank you for this presentation. It's very beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you for that question. I love that question. And here's why. Here's why. This has to do with the two cultures. Um, and exactly one of the places where the arts and the humanities seemingly on one side and STEM and medicine on the other side have different methodological structures and features. And perhaps this is something that we can continue to think about together. So 
first of all, no, this is not therapy. This is absolutely not a therapeutic practice because when you have a therapy, you have a protocol, you have outcomes, you have quantifiable metrics and measures with which to out, you know, with which to, with which to measure and evaluate and assess this. This is artist in residence. So it's an intervention. It's a, it's a creative intervention. And so the, sh the light part of that, the good part of that is that without the protocol, it means you don't necessarily have restrictions. You don't have to abide by this or that. You don't have to color in the lines and stay in certain boxes. I mean, obviously, there are just basic ethical protocols that are, you know, that you would follow within any healthcare um, situation. But I have tremendous freedom, as does the person. And so that with that freedom comes the expansiveness and vision and voice and creativity. It's almost a kind of radical freedom and privilege um, to go wherever things need to go, especially at end of life. Um, the downside to that is that, no, um, I do not have a quantifiable way. I have, res I, I, there's just not been, um, it would be you know, about what, um, uh, having questionnaires, you know, scales one to five, what is your level of pain, you taking blood pressure, et cetera, and then before and after, how would one begin to assess this? And then the reason, one of the reasons why I have resisted this is because the minute that you have those kinds of quantitative metrics that then can buttress and provide a framework for something like arguing for therapeutic practice, the minute you do that, these people become human research subjects. You are now into, um, you know, HRS protocols. And when I'm artist in residence, they are not human research subjects. It's not human subjects research. They're human beings in a bed as just, and I'm a human being who's coming in to visit them. And so this has to do even with the humanity of the people and the ways of uh, the people themselves and the ways in which the very cultures of clinical practice and um, therapy well, it's interesting. It's interesting about what constitutes a therapy and who gets to say, thank you, Dr. Goldberg, what constitutes a therapy and who gets to say, um, you know, right, accrediting bodies or something that's more philosophical and conversationally understood. But I do not use that term because I am not a therapist. I'm not, you know, I do, I'm not credentialed as a therapist, but I don't want to be. This is not art therapy. Um, this is artist in residence. And so it's about a humanistic, aesthetic, philosophical, creative intervention within these clinical spaces. But it's, yeah, it, it's complicated. It's So that's a conversation I'm interested in having with any and all of you online, offline, whatever. That's a great question. It's a, it's a complicated, methodologically, procedurally complicated, fabulous question. Too much to say. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brennan. We are at time. So if you need to leave, you can. But Dr. Brennan is very generous and has offered to answer any questions that uh, people continue to have. And we do have a few more in the chat here. Um, Dr. Ray asks, do you have any concerns or devote any special attention to telling stories from people who are part of marginalized demographics? Oh. Uh, for example, oh. ability, class, race, LGBTQ status, et cetera. This is again, a beautiful question. I love this question. Absolutely. Um, there too. Um, it's so interesting because you are threading a needle. On the one hand, if somebody, you know, if this is an important part of someone's life and they're telling it as part of their story and they want that to be heard, they want that to be heard, you know, and so it's it's only if um, I'm completely convinced that the person is, you know, absolutely lucid and and um, essentially um, has that kind of agency, capacity, competency, um, and wants that to be told, then I'm delighted to share those aspects of their identity. Very often, it's interesting, their own you know, race and class backgrounds very much play important roles in their stories. They are absolutely core to the identity um, of the person and to then what they love and honor in life and then at the end of life. So absolutely, those themes come out um, in the ways that the people express them. And I am always very honored and very clear about that when I am bedside about the ways in which these very rich and complex themes are emerging. Um, the one kind of, well, the, one of the, the major um, concerns that I just always have is if someone had been closeted or private about something, it is absolutely not my place to out them to anyone at the end of their life. And so there too, um, you know, it's just really stepping very carefully to just create the best outcome for all involved. But yes, all of these differentials are, are so important and they are part of the the deep fabric of absolutely individuality, life story, history, and identity. Absolutely there to be honored. Yeah. 
Thank you. And we have another question. Um, I think that would especially be relevant in a big city like Houston. Yeah. Um, do you uh, work with interpreters in this work? This is such a great question. You guys, these are great questions. I love these questions. Thank you. Um, so very interesting. Be okay, because it's Anderson, right? Um, there have been three primary language groups where this has come up. Um, it's so interesting. Of course, Spanish um, would be one. Arabic would be another. And then sometimes Chinese, um, Mandarin Chinese would be the third. Um, and so... Um, um, the, it just it just depends. I have worked with hospital interpreters. I've never worked with the technology. I've never spoken to the computer, you know, where it like does some kind of automated or AI simultaneous translate. No, I've never done that. Okay, so that's a no. But I have worked with yeah, I've worked with translators and all from all three. And what I will say is that while they're they're good from what I could tell from all of this, the very best translator, you always look for like a 14 year old child. And I know that you're all laughing as you're hearing me say this, the, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15. What's great about those kids is that they are the ones who can just sort of like go back and forth really easily. Um, they're part of the family, but they're also not going to necessarily finesse something or filter, you know, they're just going to like blurt it out, like, you know, as pretty much as candidly as they can. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's interesting, you know, and so you always, I always look for somebody who's in the family and in the room or a friend of the family who's there and happy to translate. And so I would much rather work with those translators, right, um, the natural translators than with the hospital translators. Um, and there too, when that happens, when you're working with a family member or someone in the room as translator, then they themselves are an integral part of the visit. When you're working with a hospital translator, the temptation is that you're addressing eye contact to that translator rather than to the person in the bed. It's as though you're speaking to the translator, not to the patient or their family. When it's, you know, again, that like 14 year old child, you know, you're when you're speaking to that child, you're also speaking to the person in the bed because it's literally a circuit that's facilitated and can be closed so much more quickly and easily. Um, and so I'm always looking for that. And in those cases, um, again, it does change and it, in a way it sweetens the texture of those visits as well. Um, and so those are always the best um, translators I have found. Thank you. That's beautiful. And it, it seems to also draw that distinction between these therapeutic interventions where you have to have a direct translation versus um, a translator that might be more true to the patient. And even just better word choice, like a word choice that might not, uh, you know, necessarily appear or, or be obvious clinically, but that somebody on the inside will know right away what that is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think we've uh, answered or you've answered the questions people had about the, the talk um, specifically, but we ha did have some questions people sent us before. Oh, wait, Joelle, um, I think one just came in really just like a second ago. Oh, you're right. Uh, thank you so much for saying that. Uh, in sitting with your clients and listening to their reflections on their life, how often do themes of regret emerge amongst the review of other life events? Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Again, I, these are great, great questions. So first of all, they're not my clients. And this is another way. So you guys, I'll just say, these are my, this is one of my cats. So, I mean, you're probably wondering. So like, again, this is like maybe a here. Yeah, so this is Nicholas, and if if there's a good opportunity, he's a tuxedo cat. I'll give. I'll if there's a good opportunity, I will put Nick, um, so he can get full credit for every. Um, so they're not clients, and I I do all this work pro bono. I, that's another thing I should mention. Um, I am technically part of the MD Anderson work group, workforce work group. I am badged within the system, but I don't accept any money for this either at Penn or at Anderson. So they're not clients as much, and they're too, so that there's a slightly different relationship on the pro bono component of this. Um, and so, yeah, on the regrets, you, it's, it goes back to what I said earlier, you have to kind of meet people where they are. Um, and so with whatever comes up, um, I want people to, if you have the, the feeling that it's a safe space, and I'm happy to hear and to take in and honor whatever they have to say. And so sometimes it really does involve just listening and being present. Um, sometimes when people say things, again, especially if it's an end of life context, to hear themselves say it, it's almost like there, there can be a cleaning up and a release of it because they're saying something that they may never have told somebody before or that they may 
understand and when they hear it out of their own mouth they may understand it a little bit differently it may feel differently to them as they hear it um, and understand it that way so i am there for whatever needs to come forth and when it is about regret or anything that's poignant or sad um it's not only about honoring what's there if there's an opportunity i'm always listening for it to see if there's not some little sparkle of gold that's amidst all of the dross and all right and and all of the um all of the soil there if there's not some little sparkle there and then if there's a regret it's going to be because there was a desire often or that there was something you know that they had wished for and then it can always be well tell me why that's special or important for you why is that close to your heart and then finding some way to connect if, if possible some little fragment of it to something that they can hold on to that may have been overlooked otherwise so it can it can work in multiple ways that way it can work in multiple ways that way. Um, actually, on that note, I'll, can I tell a quick adverse adverse incident story? Everybody's maybe wondering if I've ever had an adverse incident. So well, the one thing about end of life, thankfully, it doesn't happen that often, but it can happen. People are sometimes just, I want to just say, they're not in a state to be present to themselves, let alone present to anyone else. And so one time there was a room where a middle-aged woman was at the very end of her life, and she was surrounded by her mother and two of her adult siblings. And you know, again, it's a terrible thing, to, I can imagine, uh, to lose a child. It's got to be the worst thing that can happen to somebody or one of the worst to lose a child. So when I went into the room, this mother, this woman's elderly mother was in the chair closest by the door. And all I did was knock very gently, introduce myself the way that I always do. And this elderly woman got up out of her chair and physically lunged at me. And she said, you make me sick. Get out of here as soon as possible. And, you know, just and she was like literally going to attack me. And so I was just like so puzzled, like for a second. So then I just very calmly turned around and walked out the door, went over to the nurse's station, reported the incident immediately. And I'm like, you know, like what's going on in here? And people like could not understand this. They, you know, but what, and so they gave the the chance of the room a chance to cool down for a minute. And then the social worker went in about 15 minutes later to just like try to figure out what happened. The elderly woman thought that I was there as a visual artist and a photographer to take photographs of her dying daughter, which I would then sell for profit on the internet. Okay. Completely not... <laughs> like layer upon layer of not what I do, not anything I would ever do, that there are ethical protections in place never to do anything like that. But the elderly mother just was so beside herself with grief that even as the social worker tried to explain, no, she's not, this is, she's not that kind of an artist. This would never be. The woman could not, could not get over this notion in her head that that's who I was and what I was there for. So she was beside herself. So was that an quote unquote, an adverse incident? Yes and no, right? I mean, so nothing, there was no bad that came of it. But the takeaway here is that sometimes people are so stricken with grief or trauma that they are literally beside themselves. They're not in a position to be present to themselves or to one another. And that particularly at the end of life, that can happen. So I just wanted to raise that, like just so that you could at least hear one bit of sort of the wisdom from the shadows. So it's not a regret story so much. Um, but yet, no, there could, I could, if I had more time, I could tell you stories about negative religious coping. You know, I've been praying to Jesus. I'm a, you know, devout Christian. Why am I still dying in this bed kind of thing? That will come up from time to time. Um, and then being present for that. So regrets and what I guess could be seen as adverse incidents can take many forms, but there really always is, from what I've seen, a teachable moment or some degree of light or somewhere to go with this. Yeah. Thank you. I, I could imagine also that um, they're seeing a lot of different people and faces and it could be very confusing. Sure. Um, and that leads to a, an, another question. Uh, if you work with other services such as chaplaincy. Yes. Okay. So chaplains are colleagues. Um, and so um, I don't, so the answer is yes, I do work. We are all part of what's known as an interdisciplinary team, the IDT. Um, and so we're all colleagues. We all share, you know, stories, case notes, et cetera. I don't go in with chaplains specifically, um, like the, where we go in together in tandem, but 
very often um, the chaplain will have preceded me and he or she will then tell me, oh, this family spirituality is very important to them. Um, and so then um, I will ask while we're doing the artwork, is spirituality important to you? Oh, oh, good. Tell me what that looks like. And so that's all I ever say. And like then that creates the door is open for them to say anything that they want that might be useful to them. Um, and then sometimes when I go in, I will get a lot of intelligence about spirituality, which I will then share with the chaplain, you know, because it could be very useful, even actionable items or insight for the team or for the chaplain about different concerns. Um, there was one woman um, who was at the end of her life, but who was insisting that she wanted to have um, a shampoo and a bath. And like, you know, how are you going to do like she's so frail, she can't get out of bed. It's her. It turns out the reason why she wanted this was that she didn't want to die and go meet Jesus with dirty hair. Like that was literally the reason. But like no one knew why this was so important to her. But this came out right in my talking with her. OK, so now that we know that. Right. Then we can find ways to work with PTOT. We can find ways to somehow accommodate some aspect of this so that that part of, you know, the metaphysical component there can be heard, documented, honored in some way. And then again, it's about identity, appearance and sacrality. And, and it would create a better outcome at end of life for her and for everyone including for the team. And so not a frivolous request, right? And so they're, you know, how to work with the team, how to work with the chaplains, we all work together. And again, I'm just so fortunate to work with the teams that I have. Yeah. Very cool. And uh, just out of curiosity, is any of this charted in the medical chart or is that just through informal conversations? Um, so um, when I'm in the hot desk room, it's pretty much like just like the co informal conversations. There needs to be, and I don't know if there is going to be space in Epic to accommodate narratives, patient narratives, chats, et cetera. That's another thing. Um, the EMR question, you know, as far as like what can and can't be accommodated within, quote unquote, the record, right, within, that's a great question. And then that may be another question beyond the scope of this, um, of this session, but the technology and the EMR and again, voice and how that can, how that can and cannot be conveyed clinically. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question has to do um, with dementia, actually. Um, someone asked, my mom is 21 with moderate dementia. How do I talk with her about death and dying? She doesn't accept that she has dementia and we want to honor her wishes. Of course. And so again, this um, I had made an overture to answering this with even the pediatric question as well. It's sort of like, um, how does how you know you're all healthcare professionals how do you assess capacity and competency you have to meet people where they are and you can't with a, particularly with something as ultimate as the end of one's life some people cannot and will not accept that they are dying they can be right on the edge of active and still not still not you know i've seen people who are even into into that continuum actively fighting absolutely terrified and abs and just fighting refusing to accept that they are indeed at the end of their life um and so um with impaired right with memory impairment um or consciousness where there's not necessarily a channel of lucidity i i don't know that you really can meaningfully have that conversation because is she capable of grasping the concept um and what I would just say there is, did conversations happen at a previous point regarding what it would mean to honor your wishes? And so if so, I would look back at those previous conversations and then I would try to approach now with, so how are you feeling, you know? And if something happens, like what might you want? And then just to see if there's any overlapping space between where the person is now versus what they had expressed previously about what it could mean to honor their wishes. I guess what I will say again is that you really, nothing can be forced conceptually or emotionally. You can't make people, you can't make people accept this um, if they're not able or willing to. So to just know, just to, to be able to tell them that no matter what, you know, we love you and just that creating that sense of comfort and love and peacefulness and just humanity and reinforcing the humanity of it, that that will probably be the most powerful tool in the toolkit, I would think. Joelle, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> There's another question about um, medical aid in dying statutes. What is your opinion about medical aid in dying, um, which has many uh, prerequisites? They are so restrictive as to seem discriminatory and therefore unconstitutional. They seem to violate equal protection rights and exclude, exclude those patients who are most likely interested in 
and need help in the dying process? This is such a great question. And again, you know, um, if I were teaching a seminar, we could devote an entire session to that question. Um, I would say that this issue is not only complicated legally and medically, that the question itself is cultural. It's a cultural question and a policy question. And so that's why, of course, there's not one answer to this. That's why there's not a uniform federal policy on this, that different states have different um, have different procedures on this. Um, and and they, so first of all, I guess with that, having said that contextually, the bar is indeed high. The bar is indeed high on, you know, assisted um, medicalized euthanasia. Uh, um, and assisted um, practices on this. And so that does, I mean, so the, the questioner the, is, is right, that that does indeed reflect some of the discriminatory, you know, dimensions and elements of culture in general, where those with access to money and um, education are probably going to be able to access quality health care that will produce better outcomes and preserve more autonomy than might be there for those who are under-resourced or disadvantaged populations. First of all, who may not know what to ask for, who may not, you know, have the the capacity or the infrastructure to access that kind of care, and or who may have some conception of, you know, historical disparities and healthcare disparities, and, you know, have that as well, and those apprehensions that are brought in to um, an end of life context. Part of what is so complicated and important about this question is an underlying idea that some lives are valued more than others, right? And so the idea of power and privilege and discrimination, you know, if people are well-resourced um, and um, more powerful, right, their lives seem to have more value because more capital is accorded to them and hence more privilege. On the other side of that, um, there's a complicated debate around ethics and eugenics, right? And so that is part of the specter that is part of the euthanasia conversation around the fact that historically, those who are the most vulnerable and whose lives appear to be valued less will be the first ones to be euthanized, particularly if they are costing something and not appearing to create value. And so the bar is also high for ethical and philosophical reasons that are historically, culturally, socially complex. Um, and so then we now sit at the intersection, this uncomfortable intersection of so many different um, dimensions of this question regarding what, uh, you know, what an appropriate response to accessing care might look like for incredibly vulnerable populations, right? And so there's not one answer on this and the various kind of texture within policy, political um, political will, cultural will, cultural capital, let alone economic will, medical practice, and legal practice. It's all so highly complicated and interwoven and frankly polarized as well, right? Um, that there's not one answer to that, nor is there an easy answer. And alas, that is very much the context in which we, we live right now. Yeah. And then going from policy to practice, somebody um, talks about this uh, awful experience they had as a child. And I know you're not a dentist, but maybe you have some comments on this. Um, the questioner says, when I was a young child undergoing a filling, I remember the dentist putting his hand over my mouth and nose and essentially smothering me when I felt pain and started to cry. Years later in the OR helping with dental restoration anesthesia, I asked the dentist if I had experienced a bad dream. He confirmed that dentists formerly used a hand over mouth technique in pediatric dentistry. Um, and he asked, or he or she asked, is this really true? And when did this practice fall into favor? I am incredulous that this would ever be taught or even tolerated. Um, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts or comments uh, on that, even from maybe a non dental angle about these kind of uh, yeah. older practices. Yeah, so, okay, it's really interesting. Um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm not a dentist. I do not know the historical information on this. And I don't know like what constitutes professional best practices in pediatric dentistry. So, so at that part, I just am not in a position to answer. But here's what I will say, that clearly that is a trauma story. And that the whole idea of suffocation amidst, amidst the procedure itself, right? Or that even that fear or, or sense of that then has to do with air, air hunger, restraint, all of these things um, that then become part of the psyche. And so for the person who had that experience, um, I think that 
going back maybe and and talking with someone or working with someone to understand that that trauma can be very deep seated very deep seated to go back and work with that can be super helpful and important i think that um it can also then one of the the gifts in a way of the of having experienced something like that is that that provider is going to have incredible sensitivity around those issues of breath airway you know consent gentleness best practices and that you know, to even think about how did my own trauma um, experientially then create a kind of counterexample to the kind of care that I provide and deliver right now. And so to be thinking about like all that that, that person is now bringing in in a very positive way. Um, I will also say that, again, it's a story about breath. And while when I read that question, I was like, oh, my gosh, um, it reminded me that when I was three years old, I was running in the kitchen and I caught the side of my eyebrow at the 90 degree angle of a sharp formica counterpart. And um, I had to get stitches like I cut this open. And so I was three. And when my parents took me to the emergency room, I was essentially put in something I learned later was called a pupusa, where the child is like literally immobilized, right? Like all wrapped up so that the they could do the stitches. And I can still remember hearing myself scream. I still remember the sound of my own screaming when they stitched that eyebrow area. And so... And later I asked somebody about this and they're like, yeah, unfortunately, that was just considered practice. Like that was just a practice to immobilize very young children while they have to perform procedures like that um, on the head or face. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so I don't know if like medically, if they're still doing that. I hope that they are not. But that whole idea of like, how does one immobilize or make possible a kind of care? Um, again, to what extent is there gentleness or mindfulness in me that might not have been there had that kind of trauma? I don't know. Like, I don't know. Right. Because once it's a part of your history, it's a part of your history. And so then like, you know, never want to, yeah, I know the use of force by William Carlos Williams. Thank you for that. Um, I teach that. I teach that. I have a class at Rice that I teach on medicine in the museum where um, I do, um, a, I take a topic and I do set up work at Rice and then we walk down to MFAH as a group and then I teach in front of. So with that particular short story, great short story about diphtheria and William Car Dr. William Carlos Williams having to get a diphtheria swab into a resistant child's mouth, we do that in pediatrics and then we walk over and we look at our Mary Cassatt's, right? Incredible, absolutely incredible that in Houston I can have that kind of a class. But yes, there's also also, I would pair that with another really interesting, you all probably know this, from Dr. Richard Seltzer, S-C-L-Z-E-R. He has a book called Brute, right? And it's autobiographical where he's describing um, a, a, a black man who was brought um, from by accompanied by the police, open gashes, head wound, and he had to stitch this man. This man was also on other drugs, etc. And he was violent. And Seltzer describes the actual pleasure he took in immobilizing this man. And doing the work, like, because they were, the man was like, you know, sending curses and insults and all of that. But it was like literally this brute force against this brute force and how with medicine, you have the unfair advantage. I mean, these people are vulnerable. You're going to win, right, in some way. So then what does it mean to have to both perform sublimated trauma as care providers or to have experienced sublimated trauma as patients? What does that do as far as creating, again, a complex psychodynamic situation in which you now operate as healthcare providers, and in which you all live as human beings, right? These are complicated, difficult, layered, important conversations. Thank you. And I appreciate those um, reading suggestions. Uh, and that brings me to the last question about if you have any recommendations uh, for books to read that helps us get out of this reductionistic view of the human into something a little bit more fully orbed. Yeah, it's so interesting. When I saw that question, in fact, one of the first books that came to mind was Nate's book, right, on teaching health humanities. Well, and he's got several books. So I would say go look at Dr. Carlin's bibliography here. Um, because, I mean, again, if one thinks about it as health humanities, and that dental health, of course, is part of, of overall health, humanistic health, 
And all of that, what does it mean to not silo, but to be professionals who are so focused on specific areas of expertise, but then to integrate that within larger conceptions of personhood and subjectivity? What does that look like? Then how does one even teach that? So um, that I would start right with Nate's book on um, health humanities. And then I also, if it's an end of life, um, I also have a book called um, Life at the End of Life, Finding Words Beyond Words. That just, and the reason why I'm re recommending my own book is because I have like 75 different patient narratives in there and like they're beautiful they're absolutely beautiful you know and so just to be able to hear that more dense record of people's voices that would be one but um because ash michael ashby's right like the patient's voice is not heard as often um as as it needs to be um or as strongly as it should be so that would be another suggestion but yeah it's not necessarily one book when i go to teach there's not just one textbook. Um, it's really, a, you know, <laughs> these elaborate, you know, this article from here, that chapter from there. Oh, yeah, the use of force, William Carlos Williams, that's always going to be on the syllabus. Of course it is. You know, I mean, there are just certain classic texts. Um, so if anyone ever wants to see a syllabus, just shoot me a note. I'm happy to share a syllabi with you. Oh, that's very generous. Thank you so much. And I want to leave us with one last question I have since humanities is obviously important for us to see others as humans. It, it seems to also give us something that is healing for ourselves. And what could you say we could take away um, for ourselves from this work that you do? What I would really, thank you, Joelle, again, a beautiful question. Um, and um, what I would like to just say about that is that, um, you know, we are all human beings and everything affects us when we work and operate in these very elite academic environments, which we all, I think everyone on this call probably has the privilege of doing. It's always emphasizing the conceptual frameworks, the, the academic rigor, the intellectual rigor. How do we create sense for our own affective, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E -E, responses? How do we honor the fact, acknowledge and honor the fact that there are emotional components, psychodynamic components, experiential components, as well as physical and sensual components to all of this? Because there are. And so, it, again, it's such a classic question regarding rigor and what constitutes rigorous research, right? And then academically, how we transmit that. Um, how can we begin to open up space for the affective or emotional or aesthetic component that is necessarily going to inflect and color then our whole conceptions of ethics, epistemology, right? Um, and metaphysics, all of these things. And so to, to just really be open to your own hearts, um, to your own, you know, how does something feel to you? What does it feel like to be here? You're all working with subtle energy ever be even before any of you touch teeth, touch a patient, touch a body, your voice, your own presence, your kind of everything that you bring into that room is conveying messages and subtle energies that are going to have emotional responses in you and in your patients and in your families and your teams, your own healthcare teams. And so to be aware of that, to honor that and to just create the best outcome for everyone. Um, and if something difficult comes up to acknowledge what's there, to be present with it and to always be looking for that glimmer, that glimmer of light um, and to bring things to that higher place. So yeah, to create space for that effective component would be my, yeah. Would Dr. My... Marsha Brennan, thank you so much. This was thank a you. really beautiful session. Thank yeah. you for sharing these stories and for the very rich discussion and for taking so much extra time to make sure that everybody's question was answered. It's very, very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone who joined us today. We're so glad that you came to our first session and we look forward to seeing you at our next session uh, coming up in a few months. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>